weekly data talk, a show featuring some of the smartest people working in data science. Today, we're excited to talk with Nicole Blake Johnson, who's a senior technology editor at GovLoop, which is the knowledge network for government. In her role, she writes and leads the development of in-depth reports and online news stories for the government community, and particularly focus on writing for those in the IT space. Today's topic is all about how the government is using data science to help solve critical problems in the United States. Nicole, it's an honor to have you as our guest today. Thank you for having me. I'm definitely honored. So Nicole, I thought it'd be great to kick off this chat by just kind of, can you kind of share a little bit about your role and the work that you do at GovLoop? Absolutely. So I am the senior technology editor here at GovLoop. I've been here going on three years. Absolutely love my job. Special shout out to our amazing coworkers uh, and just the great work that we do. Our focus really is on the government community. And our motto is really connecting government to improve government. There's a lot of great stories out there. Yes, government has its challenges, but where are the pockets of success where people are doing really neat things that others can learn from? So through the articles that we write online, in particular, um, this piece that I worked on on data analytics, we do longer form storytelling that we call guides. And so we'll hit on a specific topic. So I just actually wrapped up one about uh, workforce reforms in government. That's a huge thing right now. Agencies are looking at how many employees do we have? Some are downsizing. So there, it's a very sensitive topic right now in government, but, um, and there was a technology component for that too. So tech really touches everything. So I just try to make it something that everyone can um, be a part of and understand. I've been to too many uh, events in the DC area where it's like, Tech, the tech community has its own jargon and language. <laughs> so how do I invite people in by speaking a language that people understand and telling stories that relate to them and really hit home? So that's what I try to do here. And you do, you do a great job because technology, there's so much jargon, especially in the data science space or even the IT space. And for you to be able to break that down and communicate it to someone like me, you know, I need like a five-year-old definition. Like if I'm five, how do you explain this to me, Nicole? Like you do a really good job of, 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 of breaking down the jargon and explaining these concepts. And before I came across GovLoop and I put up the URL so everyone can go check it out, check out the articles there that Nicole's writing um, and also the awesome resources that are available. I never really thought about how the government was leveraging data science. Um, I know that uh, President Obama was I think the first president to actually bring in a data scientist for the White House. And yes. so I thought that was amazing. That was and, uh, and I think his name was, uh, was it Neil Patel? I, DJ Patel. DJ Patel. Yeah, yeah. so DJ Patel was like, is like was doing <laughs> tremendous work uh, right. with Barack Obama. And right. um, so that was the first time I actually kind of heard about, oh, government's actually leveraging right. data science to help solve some problems. And then the work that you're doing, obviously, is kind of showing um, how that work is uh, being used, how government is using it. So I want to talk to you a little bit about your the latest report that I saw, which was analytics in action. Mm -hmm. And if you have not, for those viewers or those listening to the podcast, I've not checked it out. Go to GovLoop. Make sure you download the analytics in action uh, white paper. It's how government tackles critical issues with data. Can you tell us a little bit about that report, why it was put together, and uh, your involvement with it? Absolutely. I have a copy here with me, so I have to show the lovely design. We have some awesome designers here at GovLoop who um, just bring our work to life. So shout out to the designers. But uh, this is my third data analytics report that I've worked on. Um, you know, a lot of what I was writing initially was about cloud computing. And so government was able to, you know, store a, a ton of data, large amounts of data. But the issue was, how do we make sense of all the data that we have? We have this data here, but it's sitting in some cloud off somewhere <laughs> and sitting on a server in our data center. But what do we do with it? And so, you know, hearing what our community was really interested in, uh, we started writing more about data analytics. And I love the definition you mentioned in the Obama administration was really analytics is what helps data come alive. And I was like, that is such a simple description. Like anyone could buy into that. And so for this report, I really wanted to focus on issues that we hear about in the news every day, whether it's, you know, the opioid epidemic. We're hearing a lot about that, more and more about that. Veterans health care. How do we improve that? Looking at the integrity of government programs um, or even housing. How do you uh, properly manage housing um, in the U.S.? And so I said, let me focus on issues that really hit home to people, whether in technology or data analytics 
why would you care about this? Why would you want to read it? Because, you know, I mentioned the opioid epidemic. You either might know someone or someone knows someone who's been affected by this. And so to show them how technology is playing a role in addressing those issues, I thought uh, was key. And so the format that I did was a Q&A because I was like, yes, I could write an 800-word <laughs> story in my own words of what I got from the interview. But I said, well, let me take it straight directly from their mouth, what they said. Um, some of the key issues that we focused on was, A, you know, what, are, what is the major challenge that you're facing at your agency or organization? How are you using data analytics to tackle it? Let's talk about some of the outcomes that you've seen. What were some of the challenges? One of the often ones was just, you know, how do I get the data? How do I, you know, some other agency has it. Well, I need to mm. work with them to make sure I can even get access to the data that I need. And then even looking um, further into the future. So what, what do I want to do next with the information that I have? Or what types of tools do I want to incorporate with analytics to get um, a bigger picture? So it was, I had a great time. Um, talked about serious topics, laughed a little, joked a little. So it, it was definitely nice to hear from the people on the front lines in terms of what they're doing. So cool project. Oh, yeah, it was a fantastic guide. And I'm going to make sure to have a link for those watching on YouTube. I'll have the link in the about section. And those that are watching the Facebook Live will have it in the comments so people can go directly to get that report. And I love how you touched on some very practical issues that I think we all can relate to. You mentioned uh, drug abuse epidemic, uh, housing issues, veterans issues. I think these are all things we can all relate to in some way. Um, when I was reading about what the veterans hospital, how many people that they were serving and how they're trying to help veterans. I was thinking about my own relatives who are veterans and how they need VA hospital help. And um, so thank you so much for doing that. And I love the format. The Q&A was great. It was uh, very helpful uh, to kind of see uh, not only your questioning process, but then also like who the person was behind the scenes kind of directing all of this. And I thought it was very smart and very well done. Can you share like as you're going through this, what were some of your favorite stories? So I'll pull from, I mentioned this is the third one. So I'm thinking of, you know, stories that I've covered in here and I'll kind of take a step back on just, you know, stories I've written about in general in past guides related to the opioid epidemic. One of the first guides, um, I did a case studies format and I looked at what was going on um, in Indiana, some of the work that they're doing. And oftentimes, you know, when you're hearing about data analytics, sometimes you're hearing it from like a data scientist or a chief data officer, which are very important mm -hmm. roles, but everybody is not <laughs> a chief data <laughs> officer or a data scientist according to their resume, but they work with data every day. And so I talked to one uh, state employee who was like, you know what? I was hearing a lot on the news about what was happening with the opioid epidemic. I just love data. And so I figured like, how do I take this passion I have for data and help to do something about it? So it started with one person and that's what i really want to drive mm. home you might be one person but you truly can have an influence and make a difference and just from the passion that he had with pulling together different sources they launched like a whole office focused on tackling key issues that the wow. state addresses with data and so they're bringing in law enforcement they're bringing in um, the healthcare community they're bringing in uh people who are uh, working at uh, drug treatment facilities firefighters who are oftentimes like first responders on the scene helping to address the issue like first off even getting those people to the table mm -hmm. speaking the same language same sheet of music and he has a background in ems so he was able to kind of understand the lingo and speak their language but having them looking at the same data sets to start addressing the problem collectively i thought was huge so that was one story i really enjoyed um another one that i thought was interesting i talked to a fire chief from nebraska who was also a lawmaker who was, i was like how, how do you do anything <laughs> <laughs> and he has kids. I'm like, what? <laughs> I have a 10 month old and I'm still trying to figure yeah. out how it work life balance. But um, he was like, you know, we were going through like tough budget times and we wanted to get more fire trucks. But it's one thing to say we need more fire trucks. But when you can use data to back up and explain why you need more fire trucks, like, OK, if we have an issue across town and we don't have that extra fire truck, here's how much longer it mm -hmm. would take us to get on the scene to respond to that issue. And not only did he you know, take the data, but he presented it in a format that anybody can understand. I love visualizations. So the way he was able to tell his story and make it visually appealing, he was like, that was everything. And so a lot of these interviews that I'm doing, even HR, you know, people are uh, using this, your employer might be using uh, 
analytics to look at, okay, what is the likelihood that someone might retire or someone might leave after X amount of years? Like what positions will we need in the future? So it's, you know, I find it's more, it's more commonly used than people think. Sometimes the term itself can be scary, but everybody's using data and everyone's trying to make sense of it. So those are just some of the neat stories I found, just everyday examples where people are using analytics. So I, I think more companies need people like you, Nicole, to help <laughs> tell those stories because it is like so, so crucial because I think yeah. there is like the, the side of data that is very, very complicated, hard to translate, and you need someone like a Nicole to Aww. be in the organization, right, to then help tell that story to help it make sense because it's really in the storytelling. And for example, the this big white paper that you just did or booklet, I should say, that you just produced on analytics and action in the government, it's through these stories that people go, aha, now yeah. I get it. And, and that's how you make cases for, like you said, for getting more fire trucks. I'm thinking about what just happened here. I'm in California mm -hmm. and we actually got evacuated because of the fires. Yeah. And it was a very scary time. I didn't even have a chance to even get home. My wife called me and says, we need to evacuate. And they had to leave right then. And, um, you know, because of all the issues going on in California, they had to, thankfully, we had resources. They had trucks coming from out of state to help and all that. But, um, you know, just, just hearing about the work that you're doing. Uh, and, and, great, and it's great, great also to hear about, um, people coming together from different parts of the government. Mm -hmm. I mean, that it is extremely hard to yes. do that, right? <laughs> I think about I think about just in a company, right? right? How many silos there are, and to get right. different departments talking is hard enough. But to get different government agencies that are so busy as it is right. to come to the same table to help solve these issues, uh, that's a beautiful thing. Absolutely. Um, one of the neat things I, I found, too, um, was speaking to people in the government community working on analytics, how uh, they would look for people with different backgrounds. So they're like, we have people on our team who were former lawyers, who were journalists, who provide different perspectives, which I thought was very interesting. Everyone didn't come up like going through a data science program, getting a degree, getting a PhD. Like not everyone had that background, but they were able to bring their perspective. So I definitely encourage you. Whether you have that, you know, title on your resume or not, or that degree to show that you've gone through formal training, there is something that you can offer and provide um, to a team, to data scientists, to anybody working with data. Uh, I'd say just be encouraged. You have something to offer. You have something to offer. Great. Did you? Um, because because of the, I think about all the jargon um, and how a lot of data science. Uh, can be very difficult to understand. I'm kind of curious about just kind of your process to begin to uh, make sense of everything. Right. Absolutely. So definitely a, a lot of research. Um, I love that there are a lot of reports, even reports that the government puts out on um, data analytics and big data. Um, I refer to that uh, Obama administration report that came out. I wish I had a link to share it with you guys, but it really broke down like here are the issues that we're having in government. Here is how we are defining data and data analytics. Here's how we're using it. I've read various Gartner reports. I've read, you know, anything that I can get my hands on, I'm reading. Because sometimes it's, you know, people have their own definitions. But I'm like, okay, if I can take that and kind of synthesize and look at here's the meat of what you need to know and put that out. Um, my favorite way of learning is through interviews. I love listening to people's stories. I love talking. So anytime I can go out to an event, anytime I can get someone on the phone, I love when people invite me down to their office. <laughs> they get comfortable. We start chatting. There you go. An hour later, <laughs> we're very excited. So for me, it's just understanding, you know, basic terminology. You know, when there's something hard that I don't understand, going to someone, I was like, if I need to look silly in front of you to make sure that my audience can understand, I'm all for it. Um, so really just getting getting my hands on anything I can have. GovLoop is a wealth of knowledge, too. So there are people before me who have written stories. We have a future blogger program where we have people from government who um, are experts in these areas where they write content. I'm reading their content, going back through it, digesting it. So a lot of reading, <laughs> a lot yeah. of interviews. <laughs> a lot of in-person events to really understand what's going on. Well, it's great. I mean, you're you're definitely at the forefront of this because, you know, as I spend time reading about the news and the future of work and um, as artificial intelligence is beginning to uh, have more part of our lives and 
the work that we do, having someone like you to be able to help interpret and help organizations move forward. Um, it's a it's a it's a huge skill. And uh, so, again, grateful for the work you've already been doing. And I'm excited to follow your work with GovLoop in the future and wherever you go. Um, and one of your one of your case studies mm -hmm. uh, was specifically about how the VA is using data and, and analytics to help improve the healthcare for our veterans. Can you talk a little bit about that particular case study? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm sure you know many of you have, have heard about the big scheduling scandal that happened, where there were really long wait times and veterans were waiting for care. Um, you know, it was reported that someone died while while waiting for care, and so I know. One of the big focuses is how do we restore and regain the trust of the veteran um, as well as the American public? So for VA, you know, some of their main focuses are looking at um, patient care. What are the outcomes? Um, is, is someone in our care, are they getting better? Are they getting worse? Are they staying the same? Kind of what's happening there, as well as looking at like hospitalization rates. How often are people having to come back to facilities after coming to see us, as well as um, just general operations in the hospital? And so you think about I think you, you mentioned the number two that I included in the report, 9 million veterans. It's a lot, a lot of veterans. Um, you think about the number of facilities, like the medical centers that VA has, over a 1,000. So when you have so much going on, such a high volume of patients, how do I properly understand and get a big picture of how am I serving these people? And so for VA, one of the ways that they're doing that is turning to data and looking at, okay, how do we measure outcomes? And so what they're really focused on is how do I get a real-time picture, which they're in the process of doing that, looking at in real time, how is a specific um, facility performing based on key indicators that we have, some of the ones I mentioned earlier, patient outcomes, hospitalization rates. They even have one that looks at how quickly do we answer phone calls. Oh, for wow they call you know to schedule these appointments and so they also have another feature where they can set a goal and say okay in six months we want to be at this at this place we want you know hospitalization rates to be at this number we want to make sure our outcomes are in this place and based on the data that they're inputting um, the tools that they're using can tell you okay in order to get to your goal in the next six months here are the key areas that you need to focus on they can benchmark and look at facilities and say, okay, facility uh, out west is doing well in this area, facility on the east coast is not doing well, how can we better communicate to improve that? Because at the end of the day, I mean, the veteran does not have to go to VA to get care. They can go to the private sector, but you think about the service and what they've done for our nation, like the least we can do is upon them returning or wherever they might be to make sure that they have quality care and to make sure that we're being transparent about how well we are serving them. So it's definitely refreshing to hear, you know, them kind of owning up to, okay, yes, we, we've fallen short in this area. Okay, how do we use data analytics to move forward to better track how well we're doing and meet goals? So. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And um, I love how you just mentioned just some of the factors that were being looked at, uh, everything from, the initial phone call, making sure that they're getting answered in a timely manner and setting goals for making sure that veterans are getting the answers that they need quickly to um, the hospital care and getting them out and getting them treated effectively. So that's a, that's a beautiful case study. The other one you mentioned earlier on is about uh, the overdose problem. And yeah. you had a case study, I forgot what state. It Northern was, Kentucky. Northern Kentucky, the yeah. opioid yeah. epidemic. Very interesting case study. Um, they're doing some really neat things there, and, and really, what it's the health department. And so, what they're focused on is how do we provide um, accurate and timely information to get a sense of what the problem is in our area? Because it's one thing to say we have a problem, but if you don't understand what's the nature of the problem, what counties are maybe most hard hit. You know, is it an issue with people don't have access to treatment facilities? So how do you break down the problem to show a, a better picture of what's going on? And they created, which I thought was really neat, a story map. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, it, it's a nice link. If you go to, N, I think it's NKHD, uh, dot maps. It, it's quite a long URL. I'll share it with you afterward, and hopefully you can get it out. But if you start typing in, like, you know, Northern Kentucky Health Department and story maps, you'll see it, but it shows you on a map, basically, you know, where are the, the key issues, where are the treatment facilities, like where are locations where you could drop off prescription drugs that you've already used. So they're tying in um, GIS technology to better track not only like the data, but also location-based data. And so for them, it's 
okay, we want to affect policy, but we need data and we needed to be ac accurately show the issue. So I know one of the things in particular that they wanted to do was um, launch a syringe exchange. So, you know, one of the problems that they were having in that area was a big uh, hepatitis C outbreak because, you know, drug users were sharing syringes and that was kind of perpetuating the problem. So they wanted to institute a syringe change, but there's a lot of, it, it's government, so there are a lot of hoops and hurdles and things they had to, to go through. But when they were able to take the data, visualize it and show, okay, here are the problems we're having, here is the hepatitis C outbreak, then they were able to say, okay, here's why we need it, but then let's target it to the key areas where we're seeing the biggest problems. So for them, it's really affecting policy. We talked about funding earlier, that was huge for them. How do we show what, what we're going to be doing with the money that we're requesting um, was another big thing for them as well. That's, that's great. That's great. Um, um, oh, now I'm hearing oh, a little echo. echo. Oh no! Sometimes <laughs> <laughs> it goes away. Okay. There we go, it goes away. So anyways, uh, for everyone who's watching, I wanna encourage you to check out govloop.com. You'll find Nicole's articles there. You'll find a bunch of different resources, these different case studies. Um, again, govloop.com, that's a place to go to learn more about how our government is using data and analytics to solve uh, problems happening in our United States. Um, Nicole, another uh, great study was something that was happening with the public housing in New York. Mm -hmm. And I think the stat was there was about 400,000 residents in New York who need public housing. And can you talk a little bit about how data and analytics was helping that situation? Absolutely. Well, I am a native New Yorker, even though I moved to Florida soon enough. <laughs> I like to claim it. I, I have family in Brooklyn, so shout out to them. But um, you think about just, if we take a step back and just think realistically, housing, New York City, like those two things in and of itself are, are just mind boggling. It's, it's hard, it's difficult. And imagine trying to be the landlord for 400,000 people. There's a lot that goes into that. And so really sitting down and talking to the housing authority about, okay, so what are the key issues that you're facing? One of the big ones for them is that um, every couple of years, they have to do an assessment of all the facilities that they own, all the facilities that are housing those 400,000 people. And this assessment um, comes down from the Housing and Urban Development Department, the federal government. And so they have to show that all the facilities they have are up to code and meet certain standards. But what was happening is they were constantly getting docked points during that assessment because they weren't doing the assessments of their facilities in a timely manner. And so for them, it was okay, so we're having this issue. We can't properly assess our facilities. Like, let's break this down into chunks to really get to the base level to understand what is the problem. So they started looking at, okay, is the issue that the people doing the assessments, they have too big of a caseload and they can't get to it? Mm -hmm. Is it that we need to change the way we do our routing? Like if we have someone assessing a facility on one end of the city, doesn't make sense for them to be then going out to another end of the city and back. So can we be more strategic in that area? And so they really broke it down using data. They launched a dashboard and were able to show visually, here is how we are assessing these different facilities. Here's where we're falling behind. You know, when it comes to things like simple repairs, at one point it was taking them 21 days. But I tell you, when you get data on the job and you can actually see what's going on, people are like, why is it taking 21 days? Like, let's, you know, let's improve this area. When you can shine a light on something, then everyone's really working to make it better. Now they're under four days. And so they're actually, um, you know, being recognized for their improvement scores and actually as, you know, a standard for us or other housing authorities on how to use data to break down the problem and show like, where are we not, where are we missing it? Where are we not addressing it? Because at the end of the day, I know I'm talking about buildings and assessment, but people live in these mm. buildings. Families, infants, elderly, like when someone has an emergency, a pipe busts and breaks, it shouldn't take That's right. to have it fixed. So what do we need to do to make things better? And so for them, I think it was a matter of, we have all this data, but we don't have it in a format that we can make sense of it to make improvements. So that was a big area of focus for them. And to see now, you know, they're talking about how do we get GIS involved? You know, one of the things I was really encouraged by is that they're sending their employees off to do additional training and courses so that they can keep their skills up. And I was like, that's exactly what we need to do. It's one thing to say, I want to do data analytics, but when you don't empower your employees to do it, well, what are you expecting? So I, I like to see that they were not only talking the talk, but they're putting the money and the resources behind training their people 
to make sure that they can contribute in a meaningful way. Yeah, and, and Nicole, I love how you, uh, as you're expressing this case study, we talk, when you're talking about housing uh, issues in New York, um, you're often not thinking about the families. And I love how you just, you made a story, you made a very compelling case by pointing out there are grandparents, there are children, there are husbands and wives, there are single moms, single parents. Um, that humanizes the story. That makes it far more compelling and it gives you far more reason to like, we need to do something because you're not talking about a house, right? right. We're talking about people who are trying to make their situations better. And um, so the fact that you're humanizing these stories, I think is very, very compelling. And and, and just another another props to you for doing great work uh, mm -hmm. with these case studies. So um, I know we're coming towards, towards the end of the interview. Um, at the end of your uh, report, I, I, I love the fact that you provided some tips on how people can work with data. And I wonder if you can just share uh, some of your favorite tips, because you had some great ones that were provided, uh, some, some tips for people who are working in organizations on how to leverage data. Absolutely, so I have my handy dandy list here. My awesome. tips are best, <laughs> um, And sometimes, you know, like people provide these grand type of tips, which I love grand, but I'm like, what's practical? Like, what can I do today? And so one of the ones that was just so simple and I included as a first tip is just to roll up your sleeves and dig in. You know, one of the things that I, I always encourage um, people to do is somewhere in your office, somewhere, someone's using data to do something. If it's a matter of like walking over to their desk and saying, hey, I heard that you were doing X, Y, Z. Like, do you mind showing me how you did that? Or you might be in the middle of a project, but maybe I can get 10 minutes of your time on a Friday to see like what you're actually doing. So not being afraid to get started. Um, that example I mentioned of the Nebraska firefighter. He literally downloaded some software off the internet. I am not um, really <laughs> okay. government to do that. Yeah. But on his own time at home wow. on his computer, downloaded off the software off the internet and was able to plug in numbers and just get started. Love um, that. Another one was don't be afraid of data analytics, especially if you know your role or title is not uh, data analyst. I love this. Uh, Post I saw from someone on LinkedIn, he called himself an imposter data scientist. <laughs> I <laughs> like that. Super cool work, but he's like, I don't have a degree, but here are the different things. I that love I that. Do. That should be a blog. That should be a blog. I know. <laughs> I love that. A big one was share your data. Hmm. Um, you might not be the person doing the actual analysis, but you have a role to play, especially if there's information you're collecting or something that you know that could be helpful to tell a bigger story, help to break down that silo to say, here, I, I think I have something that can contribute to the overall story you're trying to tell. Um, I know some people are a little hesitant because they're like, well, my data is dirty data or, you know, we're not doing so hot. I don't want some reporter to come and look into the things <laughs> that we're doing. But, you know, it's like you can't really I, I love this. Um, one thing my pastor says is that you can't affect what you don't inspect. So like if you don't know what's going on, how can you even move to make the problem better? So I love that saying. Um, and another one that I will share is this one is work with your business owner to understand what information they need to be more efficient. And so in that case, you know, this is maybe more directed to someone in IT or someone in that chief data officer role. Like you're serving lines of business who do work to serve citizens, whether that's making sure that they are getting their social security benefits on time or practical things that we all rely on and need every day, you know, sitting down to understand the problem that involves not speaking jargon that people don't understand. But when you can connect with them on that level to say, like, I understand you're working to make sure that school kids have meals at lunch. Like, here's how this project I'm working on with, you know, data, I think can help you all to meet that mission. When you use like those keywords, I think that's a way to slide yourself in there and show that <laughs> you, you really care. So love I, it, love I, it. I, I think, you know, speaking in terms that people can understand is a huge one that I, I advocate for every day. Yeah, I love that. And and you definitely did that in this report and it clearly shows. And, and also just talking with you and the way that you communicate these stories, um, you, you make it so accessible to everybody. And, it, and it's a, a great way to, you know, just to show how government is using data to solve problems and uh, making it accessible to everybody. So um, before we go, Nicole, can you share with everyone where they can get this latest report? 
Absolutely. If you go to govloop.com and you go to the resources section, there's a tab across the top as well as on the right side of the screen. It'll say resources. If you click on that, you'll actually see a host of different resources. If you click on analytics, you'll see all of our guides related to data analytics. And I also want to put a plug in. In addition to these type of written resources we do, we do free online training and we have self-paced courses on GovLoop Academy, where um, we talk about things like data analytics. If you're just trying to understand even the fundamentals, because you want to, you know, be able to sit in a meeting and show that you know a little bit about a little bit, <laughs> <laughs> then, then that's really helpful. It, it goes both ways to understand, you know, what the technologists are talking about, the terms they're using, as well as understanding the problems that everyday people face. So I, I, I love that resource. All the things on our website are, you know, just out there to help people continue to do the great work they're already doing. Great. Thank you so much, Nicole. And uh, before we go, I want to let everyone know, if you'd like to learn more about Nicole's work, find her on Twitter, find her on LinkedIn, and also the reports, you can go to ex.pn slash govloop. That's a short URL that'll bring you over to our Experian blog post that'll have the full transcription of today's video. So again, Nicole, thank you so much for your time and looking forward to staying connected with you. Thank you. And tell me your stories. I'm here to listen. So thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Nicole. Bye. Bye-bye.